The texts of Lent are hard texts. They lead us to places where we do not want to go. They lead us on journeys that are hard and rocky. Two weeks ago, the text that we explored was from Paul's first letter to the United Church of Corinth, in which he reminded them for all of their wisdom, for all of their power and their strength, what really was at the core of their faith was Christ crucified. That the wisdom of God is wiser than that of human beings. That God's strength is more powerful than our strength. It's a tough word. We preach Christ crucified. And then last week it was from Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Equally difficult text. One that in which the apostle wrote to the Ephesians, to the church of Ephesus, and said, you know what, you've been given this gift of new life, and you're squandering it. But then in the next paragraph, he offered even more challenging words, because then he talked about mercy and grace and the gift of God's love, and whether or not we have the faith and the strength to accept such. The texts of Lent are challenging texts. And so too are the ones that we've already shared this morning and the third one that you'll hear in just a moment. Psalm 51, a psalm attributed to David, supposedly after his affair with Bathsheba had been found out. And King, the mighty King, appeals to God and says, Create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, but restore me to the joy of your salvation. Sometimes to have a clean heart, one also has to have a broken heart. And then the words of the prophet Jeremiah that we used for the call to worship, where Jeremiah is talking to the people of Israel who are in a time of exile and reminding them that they and their ancestors had broken the covenant the covenant that God had made with them after God had brought them out of slavery into freedom, cared for them in the wilderness, and offered them new life in a promising land. And Jeremiah reminds them, or tells them anew, that God is going to create a new covenant. And unlike the covenant that was first writ on those, written on those stone tablets, one that could easily be broken, God will write that covenant on their hearts on their hearts. Sometimes for a new covenant to be written on our hearts, our hearts need to be broken. And then that comes to, that leads us to the passage from the Gospels, from John's Gospel, where, John, where Jesus is telling his disciples and anyone else who will listen what it takes to find new life. So I invite us to open up our hearts and our lives to receive this ancient word that it might give us new life. And then after the scripture reading, we join together in singing, in the bulb there is a promise. But first, let us be open to the good news. The good news of Jesus Christ. Now, among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Beth, Beth, Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Word of God, word of life. Let us be together in a time of prayer. Let us pray. Help us, O Lord, to see and to hear your word and your work in this world. Help us to hear your life-giving word in the ancient words of scripture and in the new words of song. 
So open us, we pray, O Lord, to the gospel and the good news we've heard read and shared and to the gospel and good news of the song we've just sung. Let them both go deep into our lives to be enlivened by your spirit that we might know your new life and offer that life to others. We pray in your name. Amen. And the third verse that we didn't sing, because it's not quite Easter yet. In our end is our beginning, in our time infinity. In our doubt there is believing, in our life eternity. In our death a resurrection, at the last a victory, unrevealed until its season, something God alone can see. The composer Natalie Sleeth wrote those words as her husband was dying from cancer. She wrote them in 1985. I knew of Natalie Sleeth in that period of time because I was the associate minister at a church in Middletown, Connecticut, and we used a lot of her music for our children's and youth choirs. And much of it was peppy and life-giving and fun. And then the last Easter I was there, we came across this one in 1987. And it is something to see seven, seven and eight-year-olds and 12 and 13-year-olds and 14 and 15-year-olds singing in our death a resurrection and at last a victory. But in that congregation and in those children's and youth choirs, were children who knew about dead ends. There was Luke and Nico Higgins, whose father had been killed by a drunk driver two weeks before Christmas, just a few years before, when Nico was nine and Luke was 12. There was Stacy Kindall, whose parents had divorced when she was two, and she was being raised by her father because her mother had never been able to get completely free of drugs. There were Ling and Sopat, a young Cambodian couple who had a child who was five years old and in the children's choir. Ling and Sopat, who had lived under Pol Pot's regime in Cambodia, managed to escape, but not with anyone else in their family. In our death, a resurrection, and at last, a victory. The thing I love about the Christian faith is that it's honest. It's honest not only for those of us who are adults, it's honest whatever our age might be. It's honest about those times in our lives when because of the choices we've made, we need like David did to cry to God, create in us a clean heart. Help me get a new start. Let me let go of the past and move on. In the words of 12-step programs, to make amends to whomever I can, but at the same time, not be bound by the past and move on to the next stage of life. It's honest through the words of Jeremiah his heart breaking because of his people being in exile. Not only because of the power and the might and the chariots and the swords of the Assyrians, excuse me, of the Babylonians, but also because they themselves had so turned away from God, had not cared for the whole community, had let their greed and their fear get the best of them and had broken time and again the covenant. Not just those Ten Commandments written on stone, but all the ways of living together that cared for the least among them. The words of Jeremiah saying, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will write a new covenant. Not one written on stone that you can break, 
but one that I am going to write on your hearts. And I will be your God, and I will put my word in you, and you shall be my people. And maybe you'll get it right this time. And if not this time, then I'll keep writing it. <laughs> or the words of Jesus. A few hundred years after Jeremiah, also offering a new covenant. But reminding his disciples and anyone else who would listen that to do that, sometimes we have to let something die. We have to acknowledge it's broken and we can't fix it. We have to acknowledge we're at a dead end. And there is one, only one, who can bring us to new life. Unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, says Jesus, it will remain dead. But if it dies, then maybe there's the possibility of new life. If it goes down deep enough into that darkness of the earth, then maybe it can bring forth fruit to new life and new light. I think Natalie Sleeth knew that as she wrote these words, in the bulb there is a promise. There wasn't a thing that she could possibly do to change the march to death that her husband was on. But what she did do was to take that horrific experience and write this song as a way of reminding herself, but reminding any of us who sang it 35 years ago or any of us who sing it now. In the bulb there is a flower, in cocoons a hidden promise, in the seed an apple tree, something God alone can see. The children of the First Church of Middletown, Connecticut in 1987 needed those words, needed those words. Luke and Nico and Casey and Lynn and Sopat and all the others. And if they didn't need them right then and there, they were going to need them sometime in their lifetime because none of us get out of this life alive. None of us get out of this life without our hearts being broken. None of us get out of this life without knowing that there are times we do things that we wish we had not done and we leave undone the good we wish we had done. And that we need new starts, clean hearts, hope, the reminder of apple seeds and bulbs and cocoons and the reminder of scripture itself. That if God could somehow create a new and clean heart in old King David, then what could God do for you? If God could hear the cries of the Hebrew people in the exile of Babylon, and write a new covenant on their hearts, what might God write for us, individually, as a church, as a nation? And if Jesus could preach about a grain of wheat that falls to the ground and dies just a few days before he himself will be lifted up and die, but promise even in that death there is new life, then what can God do for you and for me and for this world? In the bulb there is a flower, in the seed an apple tree, in cocoons a hidden promise, butterflies will soon be free. In the cold and snow of winter, there is spring that waits to be, unrevealed until its season something God alone can see. Trust that promise, my brothers and sisters. It will give life to you, to us, to this nation, to this world. Thanks be to God. Amen.